I call this meeting of the Northeast Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The board will now adjourn into executive session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code Section 551.071, private consultation with the board's attorney. 551.072, discussing purchase exchange lease or value of real property, 551.074 to discuss personnel or to hear complaints against personnel, and the time is 531. The board will now reconvene into open session. The time is 653. On behalf of the trustees, I would like to welcome you to this evening's meeting of the Northeast Independent School Board. This is a business meeting of the board held in public. We appreciate your attendance and request your respectful attention. We welcome your comments during the matters from the floor section of the agenda. If you signed up to address a specific action agenda item, you would be called at that time. Finally, I would like to remind you that it is the mission of Northeast to challenge and encourage each student to achieve and demonstrate academic excellence, technical skills, and responsible citizenship. Item five, invocation and pledge of allegiance, Jackson Middle School, Ms. Deason. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests. It's my pleasure to introduce Joey Verstegen, who's going to be doing the invocation for us this evening. He is here with his mother, Janet Verstegen. Joey's a member of our NJHS, our award-winning yearbook, which he always has a camera ready to take a picture at any time. Um, he's a member of our basketball and track team, our all-A honor roll, and participates in academic UIL as well as our GT program. We also have Mia Hoffman here, who's going to do our pledges for us, and she is with her sister, Nicole Hoffman. Mia is a member of our NJHS, our honor roll, a member of our volleyball and basketball team, and our award-winning band. Joey, you want to come on up? Thank you. First off, a thank you to all of the caring and contributing hands that so graciously work to their greatest abilities for a brighter future, and this life of mine and of thousands more across our district is due. So sincerely, much thanks toward you all. It is with great pleasure that I stand here with the honor of presenting the invocation to commence this board meeting. As a student, especially of Jackson Middle School, I experience the cultural diversity of our great city every day, and the impact of learning about and being incorporated into the mix of many ethnicities has been a critical factor in forming my life as I have grown up, as well as the whole of the rest of my peers throughout our 14 middle schools. Jackson has definitely been an extremely positive experience for me, and I see that same mutual feeling from so many of my friends every day. Being around such a variety of people and personalities has shaped my own character into an open mind like no other experiences could have. None of my bonding with others would be possible without the caring love our teachers form with us throughout the year. They truly are the best we could ask for, and the memories I, like countless others, have formed with my teachers have been life-changing. I believe the best teacher is one who focuses intently on the student's flaws and does all they can to build on and improve those weaknesses to better complement one's greatest strength. This trait is the exact one our teachers possess and use to their greatest capabilities for our benefit. They push us, encourage us, and they give us the confidence to be ourselves, helping us create our own friendships that last a lifetime. Also, I would like to recognize the incredibly immense sacrifice our teachers make every single day to teach, care for, and protect us as students. With recent tragic events occurring on school grounds across America, the risk of our daily dispute is seemingly as high as ever. But our teachers, acting as an incandescence among darkness and harm, take the responsibility of holding our lives within their grasps, ensuring as best they can that our safety is in good hands. And by the grace and the blessing of God, may we stay with peace, stay with a sense of security, and stay with our full integrity to continue toward the ambitions and goals we have set for ourselves to become the best individuals and companions we can. Appreciation and commendation are owed to everyone here tonight for our education, opportunity, and assurance of protection. May we all cooperate and understand one another tonight in unity to provide success for each step our district takes to pull the greatest potential out of every one of its students. We should all strive to empower one another 
innovatively collaborating to create the most intricate, joyful, and inspiring experiences possible. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Joey and Mia, would you please come to the front? We have some certificates, and Mrs. Huey's going to give you your certificates. And I want to tell you what an amazing young man you are based on what you your inspiration. That was just wonderful. And thank you, Mia, for being here also. And I know that you have a big day tomorrow, so you are welcome to go home, get, have a good dinner, get a good night's rest. Thank you again for being here. We appreciate it. Item six, matters from executive session. A, personnel including but not limited to administrative appointments pursuant to government code section 551.074. One, possible action regarding routine personnel including but not limited to administrative appointments. Do I have a motion to approve as presented in executive session? I move that we approve personnel as presented. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the motion carries. Item two, introductions. Thank you, Madam President, board members, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor this evening to introduce our new director for the Northeast School of the Arts, Ms. Sarah Pagona. She will be at the next board meeting, Dr. Gotardi. Okay. Then I'm going to go ahead and do a quick introduction of her this evening. Sarah joined the Northeast family in 2006. Prior to being named the director of NISA, she was an assistant principal at Driscoll Middle School. Ms. Pagona received a bachelor's degree in art in 2004 from Trinity University. She earned a master's degree in teacher leadership in 2010 from Lamar University. Ms. Pagona has 12 years in education and we'll be glad to introduce her again at next month's regular meeting. Thank you very much. That concludes all of our, uh-oh, we do have some other introductions. Thank you for, for reminding me. We have some Boy Scouts in the audience. Uh, if I, I ask you to please stand when I call your name. We have um, Mikeen Malloy. McKean Malloy, McKean. <laughs> McKean is a sixth grader at Bush Middle School and he's here tonight to uh, work on his citizenship in the community badge. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you for being here. Right. <laughs> we also have with us this evening a ninth grader from ETA and he is Dominique Baldessari. Dominique here, there he is. <laughs> Dominique is working on his communications badge and we thank him for being here this evening and welcome him. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Item B, possible action on the purchase, purchase exchange lease or value of real property pursuant to government code section 551.072, no action. Item C, possible action regarding consultation with board's attorney Pursuant to government code section 551.071, one pending and our possible litigation, no action. Item seven, recognitions. A, read to the final four, Dr. Micah. 
Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests. I'd like to ask Patty Salzman, the executive director for curriculum instruction, to come to the microphone to address this. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests. This evening, we would like to take some time to recognize some educators and students for their outstanding achievement in reading. As you may have noticed, you probably could not have not noticed, we recently hosted the Final Four in San Antonio. <laughs> The NCAA, what many people don't know is that the NCAA is very committed to contributing to communities where they host championships. So in uh, some of the ways that they do that is by um, contributing money for after school programs, for uh, extended uh, day programs, for parks. Uh, another way that they do that is by hosting a reading challenge that's similar, uh, it's a bracket style reading challenge, similar to the final four. The goal of this program is to inspire reading and to increase student achievement. So the program, as I said, is modeled after the NCAA March Madness Tournament, and the tournament begins with 68 schools from around Bear County. So I believe all of the districts in the county were represented. Northeast began with 10 schools, and the schools with the highest reading minutes by average would be able to advance each round. So they started with 68, and then it went to 32, then the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, the Final Four, and then finally the championship round. On April 2nd, Clear Spring Elementary School was invited to the NCAA Fan Fest downtown as one of the final four schools. There, Clear Spring was announced as the runner-up for the final four. The road runners read over one million minutes. That's amazing. And they definitely had a blast doing it. And so tonight, we would like to acknowledge the road runners. So we're gonna start, and I'm gonna ask you to come up here and face the board with uh, the principal of uh, Clear Spring, Carlos Hoffman, Catherine, Catherine Bruni. She is the person who coordinated it. She serves as the instructional coach on the campus. And then we also have several teachers. So Tanya Garza, Lisa Rendon, Courtney Teagarden, Kessia Vela, and Amber Leon. This reading challenge was for third grade. And so while they're congratulating and finding certificates, I'll tell you that we know the profound impact reading has and the research and what it says about students having to read on level by third grade. So we appreciate the NCAA's partnership in helping encourage the reading on the campus. And we acknowledge the commitment that these educators had to making sure that it went very, very well on their campus. All right, yay. So as with any great endeavor, it takes a village, right? So if you're from Clear Spring, if you're part of the community, students, parents, teachers, and you're here to support the third grade and uh, Mr. Hoffman, would you please stand? There's quite a bit of support, I think, in the audience. So in addition, to acknowledging the uh, school that had the highest readers, there were also uh, other awards given. So the NCAA was going to, they awarded a nice shiny bicycle to the two highest boys 
in the tournament of all the schools and to the two highest girls. And I'm very proud to announce that Northeast took both positions for top girl. So Bo Bolverde Creek was also invited to the Fan Fest because th both of the students are from Bolverde Creek. So at this time, I would like to ask Rory McCain and her parents, Courtney and Cesar Fernandez, to come to the front. Yay! <laughs> I'd also like to invite Madison. I'm going to take one for them. So that, yeah. I'd also like to invite Madison Ortega and her mother and father, Michelle and Ruben Ortega. These two young ladies read more than over 7,000 students. I'd also like to acknowledge because we know that this wouldn't be possible if they didn't have a strong commitment to the Final Four Reading Challenge. I'd also like to acknowledge the principal, Michelle McCoy. <laughs> the lead, Michelle Bennett, who's the librarian. She uh, coordinated it. Uh, Yuna Choi, third grade teacher. Sydney Arnett, third grade teacher. I think that um, we can all celebrate with the fantastic performance that Northeast had in the first NCAA Reading Challenge. Thank you. And you also are welcome to leave. You're welcome to stay. But I know it's a um, school night for you all. <laughs> Big day tomorrow. Um, item B, 2018 TMEA All-State Musician, Dr. Newman. Thank you, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests. At this time, I'd like to ask Julie Shore, our executive director for fine arts, to address item B. Good evening. Beginning in the fall of 2018, over 60,000 students from around the state of Texas began the audition process for TMEA. Out of this large number, only 1,700 students will be named as one of the TMEA All-State Ensembles. This year, we were honored to have 33 Northeast students in band, choir, and orchestra who earned a chair in one of these All-State Ensembles, which is a huge accomplishment. So tonight to celebrate our 2018 TMEA All-State Band, Choir, and Orchestra students. We'll begin with Blaine Bryan, Churchill Orchestra. Elise Estrada, Churchill Choir. Ethan Gerwitz, Churchill Band. Kyle Manny, Manny Nantan, Churchill Choir. Om Joshi, Churchill Orchestra. Anthony Page, 
Churchill Band. Abigail Stewart, Churchill Band. Owen Bjornsson, Johnson Band. Tommy Brennan, Johnson Band. Eli Canales, Johnson Band. Nick Detmer, Johnson Choir. Braden Laird, Johnson Band. Isaac Lavanier, Johnson Band. Aaron Lira, MacArthur Band. Anthony Lira, MacArthur Band. Aiden Alcazar, Nisa. Ethan Esquivel, Nisa. Abby Allen, Reagan Choir. Mary Dillon, Reagan Choir. Kimberly Melendez, Reagan Choir. And Sydney White, Reagan Choir. I would also like to thank all of the amazing directors that helped make this possible. First, Mr. Jody Noblet, director of our music programs for the district. Jason Thibodeau, Churchill Orchestra Director. Tony Ruiz, Churchill Band Director. Evan Berry, MacArthur Band Director. Dan Masaccio, Johnson Orchestra and Band Director. Mark Tweehues, Nisa Orchestra. Brooke Holyoke, Churchill Choir. Christy Brown, Johnson Choir. And Jarrett Lippman, Johnson Band. Congratulations to all of our students and their amazing directors. We're going to have you squish way in, get real close. Get to know your friends, get real tight. There you go. And then if the person behind you is shorter, Please stay there. Parents would like to take pictures too. Just give them one second. Parents, feel free. Thank you guys so much. You can exit right out the front. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate your time.
Item C, library services recognitions. Mr. Villarreal. Uh, yes, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Guitard, executive staff and guests, I call on Bay Haggerty, our director of library services, to discuss this recognition. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff, and guests. Um, you will find that the proclamation, School Library Month proclamation in your folder. So I'm going to go right into the recognitions. Librarians are first and foremost teachers, and to be recognized by peers in the following categories is a high honor. Since 1969, the Teacher of the Year program has honored excellence in classroom education and provided a forum to showcase many outstanding educators whose efforts and example have inspired their students, colleagues, and the community they serve. NEISD first year librarian, Tracy Shingler, has been chosen by her West Avenue staff for this honor. Congratulations, Tracy. Come on up to the front. We'll have a few more people joining you in just a moment. Among the criteria for inclusion to the Trinity Prize for Excellence in Teaching Award is outstanding classroom performance, leadership in the school and school district, leadership in the education profession, and outstanding community service. Five NEISD librarians have been chosen for this honor this year. Um, please come to the front as I call your name. Terry Ramirez at Bradley Middle School, and Terry is not here this evening. Missy McBee at Wilshire Elementary, and unless she came in late, I, I haven't seen her either. Uh, Lori Darslick at Hardy Oak Elementary. <laughs> Dawn Fontana at Regency Place Elementary. And Janelle Schnocker at MacArthur High School, and I'm sure she doesn't want me to tell you this, but this is her third year in a row to receive this honor. Okay, so. Picture time. <laughs> I'll just Photoshop us out of here. Mm -hmm. just use the computer program. And, and now Photoshop we have a short out. presentation to celebrate School Library Month within the, uh, with the 2018 theme, Leading Beyond the Library. With Natalie Watts from Hebner Road Elementary, Cecilia Godoy at Ed White Middle School, um, Michelle Lewis from Kruger Middle School, Didi Davenport, lead librarian for the Molly Pruitt Library, and Lynette Pettis, school librarian at Roosevelt High School, will come to the podium to introduce their videos and speak just a moment about what they and their students created for this presentation. I'm Natalie Watts, the librarian at Hebner Elementary School, and one of my community outreach programs is a preschool story time. I'm in my 11th year at Hebner, but about six years ago, I wanted to reach out to the community, and really it was a little bit selfish because I wanted to just spend time with a little baby three to five year olds and read books and sing songs and make crafts. And it has just grown and the rewards of developing the relationships with the families in our community, inviting future Huskies to come in. Um, and also now seeing those kids as they become Huskies at the school and having already a relationship with them before they even start their uh, school experience there. Um, this past February, we had our record number of participants. We had over 30 preschoolers come. Um, not all of them in the Hebner community, so word has spread and they're all welcome. And our next one is next Friday. Uh, we're doing frogs and it's at 1045 if anyone wants to come and sing some songs and read some books. Um, but it's a really fun experience and I have a little video to show you what it looks like.
my name is Michelle Lewis and I'm the librarian at Kruger Middle School. My name is Cecilia Godoy and I am the librarian at Ed White Middle School. Uh, last school year, uh, the data program at Roosevelt High School um, sent out a call to all schools um, to participate in uh, the STEAM Carnival to promote science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics um, by uh, exhibiting um, some of those things that we do in our school library programs where we already incorporate those elements. Um, I invited uh, Cecilia to um, collaborate with me on this um, carnival because both of our schools feed into Roosevelt um, and uh, Ed White also has the data program that feeds into the data program at Roosevelt as well. So Michelle came up with the phenomenal idea to create um, floor pianos using makey makeys, uh, like in the movie Big, um, which is a little bit harder than it looks. Uh, but with our select students, we um, collaborated using Google Drive, lots of text messages, pictures, hey, how are you guys doing this? Hey, how are you doing this? Um, together, and we also had some low-tech options as well um, for our, the students to operate as well, origami bookmarks and Lego challenges. And we brought that all out to uh, Roosevelt, set it all up as rookies and just went at it. Uh, we had a few issues with the weather, and um, so one of our pianos became instead a video controller to play Super Mario Brothers uh, using a makey makey because the atmosphere and the wiring and the makey makey didn't quite go together. So uh, we had a plan B and it worked out and we had our students, I had a few NJHS students and uh, some other um, clubs come in and collaborate with me during the days and they also came in to get some hours at the data carnival as well. I think, who are your students? You had libraries mm -hmm. too? Yeah. Um, so this year we decided to offer some low tech options um, for our students. So we did things that we do in our libraries all the time. Um, we allow kids to explore um, with uh, Legos, Connects, we had some building challenges. Um, and we also got a chance to share our library program with a lot of uh, elementary students that are gonna be feeding into our middle school. So that was really exciting for us. It's a big deal, actually, uh, we were asked to come back this year. Uh, before we got a chance to volunteer, we were also asked. Um, and we love it because it helps us to build the community ties, to see some of our future students, to meet parents, to talk up our schools and our programs. A lot of times people have ideas and they're not quite sure, and so they got to talk to us, see what we're doing. Um, and we built a lot of excitement. And what we usually cater to is the younger, the brothers and sisters of those data kids or of just the community who have come in and to see what's going on. And a lot of times they stay at our table and they don't really wanna go look at everything else and so their parents have to drag them away. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. So our third year is coming up and we have similar plans to do something where we target the younger brothers and sisters as well to keep them engaged and entertained. We hope you'll enjoy our video. Good evening, I'm Lynette Pettis, school librarian at Roosevelt, 
And this evening, my, my colleague, Didi Davenport, and I are here representing our dual purpose school and public library. Having a public library on our campus really adds value to our school because it allows our students and teachers to benefit from having a double library collection, extended hours, and also eight additional staff members to serve them. Good evening, my name is Dee Dee Davenport and I serve as the lead librarian at the Partnership Library at Roosevelt High School. And the video that we put together for you uh, is going to show you how students at Roosevelt and within the Roosevelt cluster and beyond, as well as teachers at Roosevelt and beyond, and community members are learning, participating, and connecting through the dual use school and public library. We are open seven days a week over 350 days a year. We hope you enjoy seeing some of the things that are happening at the library. I am Christine Starnes. I teach GT English 2 here at Roosevelt High School. Um, with Roosevelt having the public library with our school library, my students, my English 2 GT students are able to use the children's section where we were able to create children's lessons that we took over to Camelot Elementary School. So the kids were able to pull books and use those as resources to help us come up with amazing lessons. One thing I love about the public library being in the school is that they're there after hours. It's a great place to study and do your homework and catch up with friends. It's so powerful to be able to come in and see our pre-K through fifth grade kids loving to read and then also seeing their excitement and their engagement when we're doing hands-on activities. There's so many things here to do. There's great technology. We have chargers inside of our couches. We have just all kinds of different things and activities for people to be interested in and connect to. Thursday night uh, is the one chance we get to sit down and be a family, and I, it's the highlight of the week for me. My daughter, uh, we play in the chess tournaments, and, and we just, it's, it's just an extraordinary opportunity to, to, to be part of the community and the family together at the same time. We just thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to share our Leading Beyond the Library journey. And I could not be more proud of these ladies and all of the rest of our librarians. Thank you. Would all of you that are here, the librarians, please come up for a picture?
hold on just a minute. What? Okay. Well, you're gonna have to. So I'm going to jump down to item B, res, or item nine, new business for possible, possible board action. Item B, resolutions. Item two, possible action regarding school library month. Because Ms. Haggerty just referenced the um, resolution when she was doing her presentation. Is that okay that I do that? Since, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, Mr. Villarreal, can I just now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you can, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. No worries. Um, so, do I have a motion to proclaim April 2018 as School Library Month and call upon school administrators, teachers, and students to recognize and support this action and to participate throughout this month long celebration? Very proudly Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Wheat, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. Now I'm going to jump back. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. I was trying to find it on my thing. That's okay. Uh, seven. Um, page seven. Item eight, presentations, a district of innovation public hearing, Dr. Newman. Thank you, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests. I'd like to ask Gary Hardcastle, uh, our senior director for learning support services uh, up to the podium for this presentation. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Gotardi and executive staff and guests. We are here tonight to have the public hearing portion of the designating NEISD as a district of innovation. For the, I'll wait until our presentation is posted. There we go. For the remainder of our presentation, I will reuse the term DOI and district of uh, district of innovation interchangeably. As we discussed at the March board meeting, House Bill 1842 of the 84th legislative session created the option for districts to become districts of innovation. The district of innovation makes available to traditional school districts most of the flexibilities made available to Texas open enrollment charter schools. Districts have to adopt an innovation plan that meets the requirements set forth in chapter 12 of the Texas Education Code. A DOI designation requires a district to have an acceptable rating in academic performance as well as financial accountability. The term or the length of time that a DOI designation may not exceed five years and at any time the district may amend, rescind, or renew a DOI plan with the majority vote of the DEIC and two-thirds majority vote from the Board of Trustees. Today, just like last time, I'll tell you a little bit of statistics and background information about DOIs in the state of Texas. Today, there are currently 722 DOIs in the state of Texas. You may recall that in March, when we presented uh, just a few weeks ago, there were only 708 school districts that were DOI. And when we began this process two months ago, there were less than 600 school districts that were designated as districts of innovation. NEISD has had the opportunity to decide which of the available flexibilities best suit our unique needs. We can then create an innovation plan that is prescriptive to those specific needs. Since a DOI plan does not require commissioner or agency approval, the district has the autonomy to create a plan designated to specifically meet NEISD student needs. Following the signing of the board resolution at our last board meeting, a district level planning committee has met on several occasions to ensure that the needs of our district are being addressed through this process. The team did research to ensure that NEISD students needs remained front and center throughout this process. In addition, a team met with four of the professional organizations to ensure an understanding of the DOI process and selected one of those members 
to be a possible candidate for a DOI committee. And that's something we'll discuss with you a little bit later on in another agenda item. The needs that drove our recommendation for the flexibility, you may recall in our resolution, were uh, uniform start dates for, this, for the school district. And what drove those decisions were the shorter semester one while semester two is very several days longer. And it also affords our high school graduates some early college opportunities to take advantage of enrolling in our local colleges in earlier in June. This academic school year, you, as you well know, our first day of school was August the 28th. And currently, there is no flexibility ability allowing the school districts to start earlier than the fourth Monday in August. Having the flexibility to begin school or instruction earlier in the calendar year will enable the district to improve active learning by balancing the amount of instructional time in the semesters. This flexibility will allow teachers to better pace and deliver instruction before and after winter break. In addition, by having the flexibility to start and thereby end school earlier in the year, students will be able to enroll in those college opportunities I spoke of just a moment ago. Our current needs for teacher certification in high needs area, in the high needs area, or excuse me, in high needs, is driven by our specific needs in the area of career and technical education in our world languages. These two areas consistently stand out as high needs areas for the state of Texas, not just Northeast ISD. For example, student graduation plans and endorsement pathways are especially affected by not having a DOI designation when the district cannot recruit and retain highly qualified er teachers in the area of career technical education and world languages. When we do not have a certified teacher in CTE or world languages positions, there is the potential of having a cycle of long-term substitutes in and out of classrooms to meet those needs. Having some fle flexibility, the district can could consider qualified, non-certified persons and putting them on a pathway to attain Texas teaching credentials. Just to tell you a little bit of the NEISD story, currently we have a teacher in a situation in one of our schools where the teacher is a native Japanese speaker born in Japan who has teaching experience in Japan and in Texas. However, this teacher currently does not hold teacher certification in our state and the flexibility of being DOI would allow the district to hire this individual or similar situations and putting them on a pathway to attain certification for Texas. This particular teacher has been a long-term substitute at that campus and her students that she serves are highly successful in the language. This teacher is actively pursuing Texas teaching credentials now and the career and technical, or excuse me, uh, Human Resources Department and our World Languages Department are assisting this teacher in attaining those goals. And then this last slide here, at our last board meeting we discussed our timeline and we've had a few adjustments primarily because the June 11th board meeting was adjusted to June 4th. So April 16th through the 30th, the proposed planning committee will explore and develop a DOI plan. On May 2nd, we'll take that before the DEIC, and if that plan is approved by the DEIC with a majority vote, we will then notify the agency of our proposed plan, and then at the next board meeting, we will be bringing the plan back to this group so that you guys could make your determination there. And that concludes our presentation. Okay, does anybody, I'm sorry? Does anybody have any questions regarding this presentation? Yes? No. Oh, okay. I thought you were shaking your head. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to jump items again, and we're going to do item 9, new business for possible board action, item C, instruction and campus administration, number 1, possible action regarding district of innovation proposed committee members, Dr. Newman. Thank you, President Rona. Again, I'm going to ask Mr. Hardcastle to address this item. Good evening once again. Madam President, board members, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff, and guests. 
we are seeking possible action to appoint the committee to develop a local innovation plan under the Texas Education Code Section 12A.003. I believe y'all were provided with a list of the 27 proposed committee members in your presentation packet. Does anyone have any comments about or questions about the proposed committee? As, as I, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, as I was um, looking at the plan, uh, I'm also always concerned about diversity on any committee, and I couldn't tell whether there was any African-American individual on, on that list or not. I'm looking through the list now. Mr. White, uh, there is diversity on this committee, yes, sir. Yes, we've well, we've well, well specifically I asked about an African American. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, do I have a motion to appoint the committee to develop a local innovation plan under education code section twelve A point zero zero three? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Wheat. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. White. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Item nine, new business for possible board act. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Jumping around, getting confused. Um, A, board policy one, possible action regarding board policy, FDB local, second and final reading, Dr. Micah. Thank you, President Grona, I'm sorry. Board members, Dr. Gotardi, executive, I'm sorry, executive staff and guests. Uh, we have FDB local, which just expands the employee child transfer to part-time employees. That would, we have figured out approximately 1,200 to 1,300 employees could then possibly be able to do a child transfer within uh, their feeder patterns that they work in. Miss uh, Christy Wilbur, the director for pupil personnel services is here if you have any other, but we recommend that you uh, go ahead and approve FDB as presented. Okay, thank you. That's a lot, 1,200. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments regarding this? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the second and final reading of board policy FDB local as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. White. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Item two, possible action regarding update 110, first reading, Ms. King. Thank you, Madam President. Board members, Dr. Executive Staff and guests, we are asking the board's approval on first reading of update 110. Update 110 focuses on updating and reorganizing several policies in the BB series of the policy manual addressing board member eligibility and qualifications, elections and vacancies, and removal from office. Uh, there are 10 policies. However, only one of them is the local policy, and the local policy has been changed uh, on the recommendation of a survey that included the district's decision as allowed by law, including the number of board members, the length of board member terms, election schedules, and the general election date of the district, and the methods of election and voting. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Good question. Yes, Ms. Huey. Do we know why the term trustee is being lined out and replaced with board member? Is there a reason that are they eliminating the term trustee or no ma'am not that I'm aware of found it curious that don't they trust us <laughs> <laughs> well they're they're taking out the whole the entire sentence yeah and adding a new sentence yeah but just taking out the term trustee and replacing it with board member seemed strange okay thanks I could certainly ask 
four second reading. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. Okay. I think it was. I think it happened in some of the other policies too that, in the legals. So. Didn't know if it was well, a pattern we were seeing. It wasn't referenced, but I will check yeah. and get get back to you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the first reading of attached local policy included in update 110 as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Wheat. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Item B, resolutions one, possible action regarding National School Nurses Day. Mr. Villarreal. Uh, yes, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Guattardi, executive staff and guests, I call on Emma Kelly, our nurse coordinator, to present this resolution. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests. I'm excited and proud to be here this evening to request a resolution recognizing May 9, 2018 as National School Nurses Day. I would like to share some information with you about these amazing, hardworking professional nurses that we're so lucky to have in our district. I'm happy to have Diane Rhodes here with me this evening. She's our asthma educator and she'll be sharing a small token of our appreciation with you. The school nurses play a very important role in the educational process, as well as promoting health and wellness in students Thank and the you. community. School nurses focus on early detection and correction of health problems. During the 2017-2018 school year alone, NEISD school nurses have performed vision and hearing screenings on Thank over 23,000 students, referring those students who have difficulty seeing or hearing to ensure they are getting as much from their educational experience as, the, as possible. They've conducted acanthosis nigricans screenings on nearly 20,000 students to identify those at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. NEISD school nurses are specially prepared and qualified in order to practice preventative health measures, assess health, and handle referral procedures. A Bachelor's of Science in Nursing is a requirement for all campus school nurses in NEISD, a higher standard than those set by any other district in San Antonio. Our nurses have expertly delivered care during the 490,898 clinic visits that have taken place this year. And I thought that was at 2.30, so by this time we're well at 491,000. Um, as a result of those clinic visits, they have made 118,000 parent phone calls to notify of conditions, confer about possible solutions, and to offer guidance and education. Another central responsibility of the school nurse is that of health educator to children and families and liaison between schools, students, and community organizations. Health Services partners closely with many organizations to improve health and wellness, including the American Heart Association, the American Dental Association, and the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District. To highlight our relationship with the American Heart Association, you've been given a Fiesta Medal which will show off our commitment to making NEISD a heart healthy district and San Antonio a heart healthy city. I hope to see an increase in the public awareness of professional registered nurses managing and providing school health services and the contrib contributions school nurses make toward the future of NEISD children. Healthy children do learn better. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution recognizing Wednesday, May 9th, 2018 as National School Nurses Day? So moved. Thank you, Mr. White. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Any discussion? Nope. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Item two, okay. Item C, instruction in campus administration. Item two, possible action regarding 2018-2019 district instructional improvement plan, Dr. Micah. Thank you again, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests each year, we bring to you the district improvement plan. I'd like to ask Ms. Terry Chidgey, executive director for performance and planning to come to the microphone for this topic. Good evening, 
President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff, and guests. Texas Education Code 11.251B requires that each district has a district instructional improvement plan, which I'll refer to as the DIP, developed, evaluated, and revised annually by the superintendent with the assistance of the district level committee. Our district's DEIC, our District Improvement Council, approved this document on March 28th. The purpose of the plan is to guide district and campus staff in the improvement of student performance for all student groups in order to attain state standards in respect to the student achievement indicators. The plan is dynamic in the sense that as additional forms of student performance and data are gathered, target areas and action strategies may be adjusted. In June, at our division meeting, Dr. Newman is going to ask us to come forward uh, with any edits and revisions following the release of our STAR data for this year, which of course, we're just beginning the STAR testing tomorrow. I'd like to introduce uh, Brandy Merriman, who plays an important role in assisting with the district plan. She will navigate us to the location of the proposed plan of, on the Northeast webpage. So uh, for the sake of the audience, some people wonder where in the world it's located. Uh, it is on the Northeast webpage. Go to the tab that says About NEISD, and very simply, it's on the right. It says Campus and District Instructional Improvement Plan. And then you go to the year and click 1819 and tonight it still says draft on it and if you approve this tonight it'll draft will be taken off in the morning the authors responsible for this hard work on this document are for the most part here in the audience tonight to answer any specific questions you may have I'd like those people to please stand to be recognized for their contribution and work on the district plan it's half the audience I think <laughs> Thank you to each of you. Each of the contributors were given a copy of our district needs assessment that contained four years of data, including our district demographics, attendance, graduation, and STAR results. This data drives the objectives in the improvement plan. At this time, I will provide you with a brief overview of the document. The cover contains the mission, mission mission statement, which you read at the beginning of the meeting, the board goals, and a statement at the bottom regarding review by the responsible person a minimum of once a semester. The next few pages contain the table of content, contents, and so we will begin our discussion on page four of the document. So I'm gonna go along the orange bar and describe each of the columns. The first column is the section, and it simply is for organizational purposes. So if you have questions tonight, if you would reference the, um, the section in that column. The next column is the board goal column, and each goal must address at least one or more board goals. Each objective must address and all of the board goals must be represented in this document. The target area is simply uh, the area of focus. So it might be math, it might be reading, attendance, um, safety, whatever the topic is. We have made a change this year in, order of the, uh, in the order of the columns as compared to previous years. Um, we began with the end in mind and put the measurable evaluation criteria as column four. It Before this was column five. And it is the summative way that we measure our success. Then the next large column is really the most important in my mind, um, my opinion, part of the document. It, it has the performance objective, which is the what we plan to accomplish based on the needs um, that are uh, delineated in the data and determined by root causes. I'm sorry, and the determined root causes. The strategies are directly below 
the objective, and they are the how we will accomplish what we said we would do in the objective. So in that column, you have what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Next is the formative checkpoints. That is a new column. So if you think about the measurable evaluation cr criteria as being the final, the final exam, the final grade, the end of the year, how did we get there? How, what did we do along the way? So we have checkpoints along the way, just as a teacher would have quizzes or nine-week tests or uh, semester exams. So uh, we have asked each of our authors to say, how will we check along the way to make sure we get there at the end of the year? We have always done this, but we have not put it formally in the document. Each of the authors can customize um, the months, so that particular one that's done by curriculum instruction, their checkpoint is going to be December and February, but somebody else's might be a different two months or even more than two months, whatever is specific to their check-in points. Then finally, there is a timeline and responsible persons. And then the resources is the final column. We are asking for your approval. Well, first, I want to say, are there any questions? Skip right over that. <laughs> you knew to skip right over it, didn't you? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Chigi or any of her or any of experts yes. <laughs> that are in the audience? OK. I have a lot of questions, but nothing that's going to prevent me from approving this draft. So I think in the essence of time, I will email, email them me? Perfect. to to Dr. Gotardi, and then he will send them to you and, or the appropriate person. Great. Okay, I just had a few questions. Just a couple of explanations, really. In section 1.1-5, it talks about um, incorporating instructional model that promotes mathematical discourse, uh, blah, 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 such as the gradual release of responsibility. I kind of, what's a GER? G-R-R, so GER. Patty Salzman will come up. Oh, and by the way, too, just before, while she's working, I really like that new column that has the checkpoint. That's, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. I think, I'm not sure why we hadn't done that before now. Yeah, that's really Gur? nice. It's a good vision. Oh, is it great? The GER. The GER. Uh, no. So the gradual release of responsibility is an instructional model. And um, sometimes in elementary, we might refer to it as the I do, we do, you do. So it's gradually releasing students toward greater responsibility for their work. Um, the gradual release of responsibility in its current iteration includes students working cooperatively. So it's I do, we do together, you do as a group, and then you do alone individually. And following that process allows the teacher to be evaluating students who's ready to move forward and who might need additional assistance. Right. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry. My thing is loading very slowly here. But okay. Here's the next one. Um, in section 12.1, or 12 dash. I'm sorry. I keep saying one. Uh, under the world languages, this just thoroughly intimidated me. But it's really. It sounds great. And I know it's been in previous um, DIIPs. And it's about uh, teachers using uh, target language at a minimum of 90 percent. <laughs> That just scares the day out. I'd be so scared in one of those classes. I mean, that's really close to immersion there. It is. It is. 10% away. Um, ideally, it's, it's not just dropping the student in so that it's, it has to be comprehensible so that really you're talking to the students more on their level like you would a small child as they come along so that you're not, so that you don't scare them. I think that was probably, so it's, it's a build up to a 90% and it's not just the first day, right? <laughs> Please? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we do encourage them to build up quickly because the faster that you get the students immersed in the language, and especially if you're talking about a, stu a language that's not Spanish, um, because we have greater opportunities, of course, for that being in San Antonio, but the, that's their only time that they get immersed in the language, so the sooner we can get there, the better. Um, a great example is our ASL classes because they go voices off the first day and so students are immersed 100 percent. Um, and while they might come away surprised the first week, um, they are very, very adaptable. So 
probably more adaptable than we are as adults. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So that means they're but not we, scared. But we offer lots of support. <laughs> they're not scared like, <laughs> like I would be. Are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry. I downloaded this into Adobe, and for some reason it's just really being pokey here. But I do know one of the others that I had at, towards the beginning, the, on, on the very first, it, it seems like everything was referring back to the star. <laughs> That's very depressing. Um, I know there's a lot of legalities there, whether it's tied to A through F or whatever. Is there any way that we could just really be a district of innovation and just dump the star? No, I know we can't dump it. That's not what I mean. It's really not what I mean. I, I, I would love to see us have some other type of uh, measurable evaluation criteria summative other than star. I just, I think we're better than that. I think STAR is punitive. I think it's discriminatory. Um, that's my personal opinions. I'm not sharing anyone else's opinions. But it's just whether this is a comment or if you have any input, I would love it. Um, it just was frustrating to constantly read, oh, this is, here's our measure, STAR, 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 STAR. Raise this, raise it to STAR. Mm -hmm. So I think our students are better than that, and I know our teachers are. Um, so I think that was an important piece for us to put the check-ins along the way mm -hmm. because we are ultimately measured. I completely agree with you, but we are ultimately measured by that. So that's why it was important. Even things like a principal walkthrough or lesson plans or those kinds of things are not considered truly measurable by the experts that counsel people like me on how to write this because they could be subjective. And so we are really encouraged to use something like attendance data or um, STAR data or K through two uh, reading levels or AMC data for math for K through two. And if I could just add, Mrs. Huey, I, I also agree with you. Um, and I think that these tests, what they were meant for was so that you could measure progress. Exactly. Great. And taking everything else off of the star um, importance, I think it is a good instrument for measuring student growth and it's uniform across the district as well as across the state. So it does serve a purpose. What about as we see a growing trend of parents who think that they can opt out or that they, or rather that they do opt out. I don't, they don't think they can, they do it. Um, is that gonna have it will if we have a large number of parents okay. I know we currently who do opt not, out. But I do know in some other areas that they are seeing a growth in it. Some of the very large districts. Uh, and Mrs. Huey, if that if that becomes uh, an, an issue and impacts our measuring the growth, then we will have to have a discussion that? about what else to use. Okay. And then this is just a suggestion. Uh, as I read through this, and I read. The, it's, this is such, these are always such incredible snapshots of our district and what is being done. The next time we have people write us that complain about bloated administration, I would highly recommend that this would be their required reading because this shows exactly what all of y'all are doing. Can you imagine this work being funneled down to our teachers and they would have to be doing this too? So this is such a perfect instrument for showing what goes on in this building that spreads out to the whole district. So it's just, it's just really great. So thank you. So I will say at the DEIC meeting, um, I had the opportunity to talk to several business people and parents, and, they, and we had a much more in-depth conversation about each part of it, and they were in awe at everything that goes on that they had no idea I can imagine, actually went yeah. on. Our parents, Actually goes on. As, as some of the most invested parents in the district that stay involved and do everything, I'm sure have no idea what goes on. I don't even like to say behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. This is the scene. Right. So, okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So we are asking, f are there any? I was gonna see, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Okay. So we are asking for your approval of the NEISD Inst instructional Improvement Plan for the 2018-2019 school year as presented. Okay. 
Do I have a motion that we approve the NEISD district instructional improvement plan for the 2018-2019 school year as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Huey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Thank you again, Ms. Chigi and everybody else who was here and who put a lot of effort into this document. It was, you all, you all did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. I do want to add one more thing in case I do not get to present or do not present, I don't want to say get to at the May meeting. I'd like to take a moment to personally thank Ms. Perkins and Mr. White for your dedication and commitment to the children of Northeast. Um, I have attended every board meeting for many years and I have great admiration for both of you and truly respect and appreciate your years of service to our district. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item D, operations. One, possible action regarding 2015 bond special education restroom renovations, 14 campuses, project bid authorization approval. Mr. Clary. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Cotardi, executive staff and guests, Mr. Sullivan is making his way to the podium for this presentation. Good evening, Madam President. Good evening, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, tonight I have uh, three presentations, and the first one deals with uh, our special education restroom project. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the agenda we're going to follow. The 2015 bond program included two projects to address <coughs> renovation needs of restrooms across the district in specific areas. Uh, the first project we're going to talk about deals with special education and the second project deals with just campus restrooms in general. Our um, project has two bid packages. Bid package one is led by Garza Architects. I'm seeing to I have Mr. Jesse Garza, uh, principal partner and owner of Garza Ar Architects in, in attendance. And he's got a group, good group of um, engineers, and Centerfield Ponticus will be assisting uh, the project as our general contractor uh, hired under the Jock Job Work Contracting Program. Bid Package 2 is led by our Carlson <coughs> and Lambers group, and we have with us tonight Chris Lambers, who's principal partner with C.J. Lambers and Associates. And he's also got a good group of engineers, and uh, Centerfield Ponticus will also be performing the construction work on this project. These are the campuses included in the special education restroom project. We'll be addressing mm -hmm. one special education restroom at each of these 14 campuses, seven e each of the bid packages. They, the, the bond program included a 15th campus, which was Regency Place, but at Regency Place with the new building addition, we included um, a special education restroom in that project, and so that covers that requirement. So this, this uh, presentation focuses on the other 14 campuses. Oops. Just kidding. That was really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo, you win. Do we have a motion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the, uh, the scope of work that we'll be providing at the, uh, the 14 restrooms. It's very comprehensive. These restrooms, uh, if you had the opportunity to visit them, are in great need of work. So it's pretty much a full facelift and makeover, uh, including flooring, uh, the tile walls, uh, the fixtures. We're adding LED lights. Uh, we need a special electrical outlet for uh, the changing table that comes with uh, each of these restrooms because the students that have the special needs need 
uh, special <coughs> equipment in order to uh, be serviced. Uh, new door and hardware, including the latch notification feature and a kick plate, uh, intercom pager with emergency notification. All of the uh, HVAC and exhaust fans uh, are going to be uh, redone, and we're going to upsize all the restrooms to a standard square footage uh, to meet ADA requirements. So some of our restrooms don't meet ADA requirements, the newest ADA requirements that are out there. So a very comprehensive scope of work. This is uh, the floor plan for a typical restroom uh, that we envision. It can be modified based on the unique nature of the, the campus layout, but this generally shows uh, the components. You have the water closet, you have the lavatory, you've got the shower wand, uh, floor drain, the changing table is located here with, with an electrical outlet. You've got to have the five foot clear turnaround for students in wheelchairs. And it's got an access in, if the campus has two classrooms, it has an access into each classroom. We had budgeted for this project uh, back at the uh, bond formation planning stage, $3 million. Uh, we have run through the analysis with both our design team and our, and our job contractor and feel that we're going to need an additional $500,000 in order to cover all the construction costs we anticipate. So the project is slightly over budget. I've added a new slide to uh, my presentation uh, that you'll see in, in all future presentations that kind of shows you the timeline and brings you through the process of how the project was originally born in the bond program and then takes you through the steps from bid authorization, schematic design approval, uh, board approval, and you can see how the project might change over time. So in this case, we're only at the second step, the bid authorization step, and you can see that our original construction budget was one million seven twenty-five, with an overall program budget of two point five million, including design fees, permitting costs, and so forth. And now we're estimating, some three years later, that that cost is better stated at two point five million dollars, giving us a total program cost that's five hundred thousand dollars in excess of our original budget. And you'll see on the two follow-on presentations uh, where we have some more information to how this better uh, lays out for you. So you can see from reading the agenda item, there's not enough information there sometimes for you to be able to piece this all together. It'll be, I think, better explained when we get to the Johnson presentation. Our timeline is to address all 14 of these campuses over the summer. So we have a very aggressive construction schedule, 11 weeks. Santa Fe Planticus is committing uh, a good number of um, supervisors. Uh, it's not going to just be one project manager or superintendent. We're going to need multiple project managers and superintendent, superintendents in order to, to manage this project as we move through uh, the 14 campuses kind of in a, uh, a phased approach. You can imagine some of these restrooms are the original restrooms and we're going to probably run into some unforeseen conditions. So we're going to need the attention of both the contractor staff and the design team staff in order to address these as we go through. Now, uh, to put things in perspective, it's been uh, several months since I've given you an update on our financial posture, so I'd like to briefly summarize that so you can see how the $500,000 factors into our overall uh, financial posture for the bond program. And again, just to or, uh, orient you, on the far left-hand column, we have just simply a project number. If it's highlighted in green, it means that project has already gone through um, being uh, awarded to a consultant to design. The name of the project is in the second column. The third column is the program cost, is the cost of all of the components of the project. That would be design fees, permitting costs, material testing costs. Geotechnical engineering, construction costs, FF&E, everything involved with the project uh, from start to finish is included in the program cost column. The program budget is what we originally estimated what it was going to cost. And the far right-hand column is the delta. If it's a green box with a white number, it means we're under budget. And if it's an orange box with a black number, it means we're over budget. In the middle column, uh, where you have the different colors, um, purple indicates a design build type contract. The yellow indicates a, a request for competitive seal proposal type contract. The terracotta color is a jock 
job order contract or DOC, delivery order construction contract. The blue is a CM at risk project. And the gray is we want use the buy board. So you can see we've got, um, as I've talked to you before, just highlight the Goldilocks principle. We have projects that are bidding under budget, projects that are bidding over budget, and projects that are bidding right at the original budget. And that's expected uh, in a volatile construction type um, forecasting through the bidding phase since there's years between those two points that you're going to have some projects that are going to fit fall within each of those three categories as we do. But if we've done a good job at the beginning of the process, in the end we will end up being in the green. That the pluses and the minuses will tend to balance themselves out. So as we uh, get through the, this page, you'll see that uh, right now, bottom right hand box, we, we have eclipsed $8.4 million in additional construction contingency funds from when we started. We bid out $342 million worth of work. We have uh, awarded $334 million worth of work, which means we have $8.4 million to the good. This does not include the bond global contingency fund that's under the purview of the superintendent and the school board. Now, moving on, uh, I've highlighted where this project falls. So the project we're talking about tonight, you can see there's uh, each of the bid packages is a quarter million dollars over budget, so that's $500,000. We still have uh, these, from here on to the follow-on follow slide, these are the projects that are left to bid out. And you can see what's left to bid out. Um, total program value amounts to $134 million. We've got a program budget of $131 million which means we're going to run a uh, shortfall of about, my estimate is $3.1 million. So in the aggregate, when we finish the bond program, the construction contingency controlled by uh, the department I manage should be $5.275 million. Add that to the superintendent and board contingency of $15 million. We should end the bond program with about $20 million to the good. That you'll have the ability to do uh, additional projects, buy down the the bond debt, you'll have any number of options with which to spend those funds. I do not anticipate any way that we're going to need the $20 million to finish what's left in the bond program. We're well over 70% of the project bid out to date, and uh, what's left are really a group of small projects, and uh, some, some I anticipate are going to be over budget, some are going to be under budget. So our recommendation tonight regarding this project, Special Education Restroom Renovation Project, is shown here, which is to authorize us to go out to bid, for Satterfield and Ponticus to go out and receive subcontractor bids, recognizing that we need to increase the program budget by $500,000 in order to accomplish uh, awarding this work when we come back to you at the next board meeting. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of the board members may have. Any questions? Where does the the twenty million dollars that's um, that's available where where does the, yeah where does that actually go? That sits in there in yeah. the bond um, fund. Well, Mr. Moy hasn't actually sold all the bonds yet, so this is theoretical in terms of when he sells the bonds. If we sold all the bonds today, we and I gave him this information, we would have $20 million that would be unallocated. But it can't go back into the general fund? It cannot. 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 Okay. Thank you. That'll be a later board agenda item down the road. What are we going to do with that $20 million? Right. 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 But it will not go for the general fund. Anybody else have any questions? Can't. Miss Huey, did you have a question? Well, quit shaking Sorry. your head every time you do that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Yeah, there was a gentleman, so Miss Stomer, I think, with the taxpayers, because <laughs> my wife was seeing a bunch of posts over Facebook this weekend of what bond funds can be used for and not used for. And you can't use it to pay Salary. teacher salaries or buy right. textbooks. But yet the public, I think, is right. um, very confused. confused on the two different types of funding we have, the m and and the bond, and they get it mixed up. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very true statement. Very true. <laughs> Super true. 
<laughs> All right, do I have a motion to approve the release of bid documents for the 2015 bond special education restroom renovations 14 campuses project using the job order contracting bid delivery method and authorize the general contractors Satterfield and Pontique's construction solicitation of contractor bids for this project. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. White. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. And thank you, Mr. Garza and Mr. Lammers for being here this evening. Appreciate that. Next item two, possible action regarding 2015 Bond District restroom renovations, five campuses, project bid authorization approval. Mr. Clary. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests, uh, Mr. Sullivan will make this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clary. Madam President, this is our second presentation. This also deals with restrooms. Uh, this was a project that was added late to the bond program. And what, what the way we approached so this project during the bond planning is, as you may recall, we put out a, a bond survey to all the campuses and asked them to rate themselves in about 100 different areas. And those campuses that gave themselves the lowest score, which we then went out and validated for restrooms, are the campuses that made the, the list for this project. There are still many campuses that need restroom renovations, but we could only put in enough money not to exceed the $499,950,000 threshold Dr. Gattardi gave us during our bond planning. So the needs are great, but these are the five campuses that were deemed to be the most needy. All right, this is the agenda we'll follow. Same agenda as the uh, previous project. This uh, project is also led by Garza Architects, Mr. Jesse Garza. And you may be wondering why he's being stuck with all the restroom renovations. <laughs> <laughs> he is one of the new architects. And uh, typically, you start out with the more difficult uh, multi-campus projects, and you work your way up. So, this is his first. Uh, these are the first, some of the first projects that he's done with our school district. He's done a great job with our Madison project, which we awarded last month, and we're looking for great things from them as we move forward in, in our future bond programs. So they've got a good group of engineers. This project will also be uh, constructed by Satterfield and Pontica's construction, which you previously approved at a uh, board meeting in the past. These are the five schools that are included in this project. There was a sixth campus, Jackson Middle School, but those red, red restrooms are going to be renovated as part of the Jackson Middle School larger bond project uh, that's already been awarded. We're doing a similar scope of work as you saw for the special education restrooms, and dealing with pretty much a comprehensive makeover, new fixtures, flooring, ceramic wall tile, jib board ceilings, toilet partitions, LED lighting, and so forth. Again, some of these restrooms are the original deal from schools that are 50 plus years old and need much help. Now on these charts, uh, what I'm attempting to show, and I'm gonna go through the five schools, is those restrooms that are designated with a green highlight have already are already um, fully up to speed they were built in a previous bond program are relatively new and don't need any work and the restrooms that you see that have the red shading or the red dot with the yellow um, background those are the restrooms that are focused on this project so you can see at the bottom of this slide this is the new classroom and admin addition that we built in the previous bond program all those restrooms are good this is the gym addition we built in the bond program before that. Its restrooms are good. So we're going to be focusing on the restrooms that you see that are in red. And you can see a lot, and back in the old days when this school was built, we put a little restroom, one little restroom in for two classrooms. We've got to go in there and we have to make it ADA compliant and meet all of the current code conditions. Once we touch one, we have to touch them all. Mm. We can't just selectively say, we're only going to, we only have enough money to do the restrooms over here. We're going to leave these for a later bond program. The, the state will not allow us to do that. They make us deal with the whole thing at one time. Mm -hmm. This is Ridgeview. You can see the restrooms in green and new classroom edition from uh, like the 2003 bond and the, and the athletic edition all good. And we have the restrooms here you see with the red dots that we need to address. That's just the second floor of the classroom edition at uh, Ridgeview. 
the cisterna. And the restrooms you see either with yellow or have the red dot, those are the restrooms that are focus of this project. And if you count all these restrooms up, there's well in excess of 30 restrooms. Some are large multi-fixture multi, uh, restrooms and some are single restrooms. So Satterfield Ponticus has committed to the district that they're going to have enough manpower and the same will be true of the subcontractors they, that they hire to be able to address these restrooms at these five campuses plus the 14 restrooms at the other 14 special education campuses. But again, we're going to do all this this summer. So by the time we start the next school year, all these restrooms are going to be addressed and in good shape. This is Walls of Elementary School. Again, you can see the new classroom addition and gymnasium were good. And then the original campus restrooms are the ones that we're going to be focusing on. And finally, Wilshire Elementary School. We had originally budgeted for this project $1.75 million based on cost estimates that both the design team and the contractor put together. We feel that we need to increase that program budget by approximately $625,000 in order to meet the anticipated construction costs. So that's going to be part of our recommendation this evening. And again, the new slide that shows the original construction cost of $950,000 versus our revised construction cost of 1.5 million, which leads to our revised program change of 625,000. Our schedule is to, is to do these renovations over the summer period in the 11 weeks between early June and late August to finish prior to the start of the next school year. And again, uh, this is a repeat of what we already showed, but I'll just highlight for you in this presentation that the project we're talking about is right there. And to highlight the fact that we've already included the program request change of $625,000 in this presentation, which means the $5.275 million, $5 million I'm presenting includes these overages that have been presented in the previous presentation and in this presentation, already yep. factored in. Did you go over those elementary schools again? It was Coker, Cerno, Wilshire. Walsham and Ridgeview. Walsham and Ridgeview. Thank you. So our recommendation is to authorize the construction manager, Satisfield Ponticus, to go out and solicit subcontractor bids for the scope of work that we've uh, just reviewed. And we need a program increase uh, estimated at $625,000 to meet our financial uh, budget costs. I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. Any questions about this item? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the release of bid documents for the 2015 bond district restroom renovations five campuses project using the job order contracting bid delivery method and authorize the general contractor Satterfield and Pontique's construction solicitation of contractors bids for this project. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Wheat. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Item three, possible action regarding 2015 bond Johnson High School Fine Arts Facility Edition and renovations project bid award approval. Mr. Clary. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Gotardi, executive staff and guests, uh, Mr. Sullivan uh, will make this final presentation. Thank you, Mr. Clary. Thank you, gentlemen, for your attendance tonight. Yes, thank you again for being here. All right, our final presentation is uh, Johnson High School Fine Arts Edition Renovations Project. It's one of three campuses included in the bond program that, that we're going to receive band hall additions. The other two were Churchill and Reagan. This is the agenda we're going to follow for this presentation. Uh, this project is led by Garza Bomber and Associates, and with us this evening we have Mr. James Davis, principal partner, if you all could just stand up, thank you, and <laughs> the project architect, Seema Johansson. Jol Jol yes, thank you. And we have a, a great group of, of engineers supporting the uh, architect. Our right, Johnson High School, our, one of our, our newest high school, uh, opened in 2008. 
The project is going to build a second band rehearsal hall, which includes an office, a storage area, and we're going to build it in such a way that it connects to and is adjacent to the existing band hall so that it makes the program use of the current band hall and the new band hall very seamless for the, uh, the band director. Plus, there will have to deal with uh, site improvement requirements that will, that will need to be uh, installed to complement the project that are shown on the slide. The site of the project area is shown in the red circle. Uh, this building at the far north end of the campus is the fine arts area, which includes the band, orchestra, choir, drama, and the theater. And the existing band hall is right here. So that's where our new facility is going to be constructed. Looking at it schematically, you can see the, uh, the pink shaded area represents the addition that's going to be connected to uh, the building. And because we are using the same architect that designed Johnson High School, we're going to use the same brick blend. Uh, when the project is done, uh, it'll be very difficult for anybody to even determine that there was an addition made to the building. That's all said and done. And there is an enlarged view that shows the, the new band rehearsal hall, the connecting corridor to the, to the existing band hall. So we're going to have to you know, essentially deal with the opening here connecting the two buildings together, which is the renovation work that has to happen so that it looks correct from both sides. And then you have the storage area, which has a sink in there, as well as an office area for the band leadership. We still maintain uh, exiting doors and we have a covered walkway that then leads out along the side of the building where they'll have their ability to park their truck to load band instruments uh, for away games and as well as for uh, t competitions because the band marching area is right across the way. We had budgeted for this project $2.5 million uh, when the bids came in. Um, our best value contractor and our low bidder, Stoddard Construction Management, was $2.46 million. And I believe we have Mr. Bob Heffley here. Bob, are you here? Yes, sir. Bob Heffley represents Stoddard Construction Management. This is our first project with Stoddard Construction Management in, in about uh, 18 years. Uh, they bid a lot of our projects and came in second a number of times. So we're very pleased that uh, they had the right combination of subs and costs in order to win this project uh, for your review tonight. But we will need to augment the program budget by $375,000 to award the construction contract as was bid. And again, my new slide, this kind of gives you the, uh, the history. So our original bond program had budgeted $1,975,000 for the construction cost, $2.5 million for the program budget, which includes all of the other fees and services. And we had no delta. When we came to you back in May of 2017, a little under a year ago, we felt that we were still in budget and had no, no need for a program uh, increase. When we came to you in February, we anticipated, uh, based on our current budget review, that we were about $100,000 over budget. You authorized us to go out to bid. And when we came back to you tonight, we have the bid award recommendation, which is a little higher than what we had estimated. 2460 which leads to our program overage of 375,000. I will tell you that the uh, the cost of the adjacent outdoor canopy that we have included in the project is about $160,000 but but uh, the campus and we both feel that that's something that we should include since there's a lot of time spent loading and unloading instruments that are very sensitive to the weather without it uh, the instruments would be subject to getting damaged if there was a rain event. And, the, the, and it happens sometimes when you're trying to offload or unload or load your truck. You're not going to sit there and wait for the rain to stop. You're just going to go for it. Our timeline is to begin work on May 1st, uh, pending your review and approval tonight, so about three weeks from now. And we have a year budgeted for this construction project finishing by April 30th of 2019. And in terms of the financial scorecard, I'll just highlight this project. Uh, shows the uh, program delta of $375,000 
in terms of needs additional funding is included in our overall uh, summary we presented of the 5.275 million that we have in our construction contingency. We've already accounted for this overage in our um, in our financial forecast view. So our recommendation this evening is to um, allow us to award this contract to Stoddard Construction Management for two million four hundred sixty thousand dollars to do the fine arts additions and renovations at Johnson High School, requiring a program increase for this budget of three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about this project. Does anyone have any questions about this project? Seeing none, do I have a motion to contract with Stoddard Construction Management at a total bid cost of two million four sixty for the twenty fifteen Bond Johnson High School Fine Arts Facility Addition and Renovations Project? It is further recommended that the Board of Trustees grant the Superintendent, Associate Superintendent for Operations and the Executive Director of Construction Management and Engineering Authority to execute this contract. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. White. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. And thank you, Mr. Davis and... Uh, Seema. Okay, thank you. I was gonna try and pronounce the last name and knew I couldn't. And then Mr. Heffley for being here. We appreciate you being here tonight with us. Madam, Item E, consent. Madam oh. President, oh, I'm before sorry. we begin the consent, there's a, um, are, there are some folks here that are here for the consent. I'd just oh, like sure. to have them stand to be recognized. Of the course. only one I see in attendance is Mr. Tom Guido. <laughs> He's walking out the door. Who represent, <laughs> who is uh, <laughs> second in command of Guido Brothers Construction. <laughs> Thank you. Marianne. Marianne couldn't be with us tonight, but I want to compliment um, the way the firm has conducted themselves for our LEAP project. It's the largest project in the bond program, uh, over $30 million, and they brought the project in under budget. And Yay. I'm just delighted by how hard they worked uh, with the subcontractors and through the design phase and the, uh, the bidding phase to bring the project in under budget. It was a great accomplishment, and uh, we're very excited about uh, getting your approval tonight so we can begin that project uh, in June. Thank you, Mr. Guido. We appreciate that. Did thank a you. really good job. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, Mr. Sullivan. You're welcome. For all of your hard work. That's all I have. He's okay. the only one here tonight. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Item E, consent. One, instruction in campus administration. A, take our daughters and sons to work day. Two, business services. A, waiver of penalty and interest. B, bid items. C, 50,000 purchases. Three, operations. A, 2015 bond elementary school walking tracks bid package seven project bid authorization B 2015 bond elementary school walking tracks bid package three project bid award approval C 2015 bond hidden forest elementary school additions and renovations bid package one site utility reroutes and temporary administrative area bid authorization approval 20 D 2015 Bond Lee High School New Fine Arts Center and Campus Renovations Construction Manager at Risk Project Bid Award Approval. E, easements for drainage, streets, utilities, and various service agreements, 2015 Bond Garner Middle School Project. F, school bus three-point seat belt waiver request. G, professional service contracts, construction contracts, and related contract amendments supporting the 2015 Bond design and construction requirements. H, minutes from March 2018. Four, end of consent. Do I have a board member wishing to pull an item from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve consent as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose, the motion carries. 10 reports. A, financial statement review of expenditures February 2018 that's been provided for you. B, third quarter investment report. It's been provided for you. C, awarded bid report, that's been provided for you. 11, matters from the floor, and we do not have anyone who's signed up for that. 12, discussion and possible action regarding board members' request for items to be placed on a future agenda and our request for a report from the administration. Do I have a board member that wishes to place an item or have anything for discussion? Okay. Um, no action. Item 13, adjournment, and the time is 844. Thank you all for being here.